Well, good evening, everyone. This is Sneakers Corner again. And we have our new guest here called Sam. Welcome, Sam. Thank you. Sam Pleased is... to be here. Great to have you. Um, Sam is going to be talking about what the early Christian teaching um, of the New Testament was, because the Quran has a particular version of events and claims that the, the Bible was corrupted and that the early teaching of Christians was lost and uh, a new kerjima, as it's called, was uh, put in place instead of that. Um, that's my understanding. It, it's, it's, it, am I right there? The, um, the Quran actually has two points of view. Yeah. The Quran endorses the, the New Testament and then it doesn't endorse the New Testament. And I want to I want to show that the Quran is inconsistent in um, in its endorsement. Yeah. For political reasons. Yeah. Excellent. And this this is a uh, this is an evidence for us that the Quran was written at different stages, or I I would say different strata. There's the proto-Islamic or pre-Islamic stratum. Then there's a stratum of, of uh, wh where the movement, the Arabist movement is being launched by whoever the leader was. Uh, yeah. Ibn, Ibn, Ibn Kabisha, uh, for instance, which, which we now call Mohammed, but the, the, it was launched, then it was developed uh, upon the death of Ibn Kabisa, and then it was fully developed in the fourth stage by uh, Abd al Malik and Hajjaj. So we see the different strata. Uh, there's a stratification in it. And so it's not consistent, and that's the reason it's not consistent. And and the, the Quran doesn't is uh, suggest that there is a book which was given to each prophet but some of these books find there are mythical or mythological books these are phantom books books which existed only in the mind of the writer of the quran but do not exist in actual fact and so uh, what i've tried to do is is find the historical book of Isa, which Allah apparently gave to Isa. Now we can't find this book. There's no other book that we can find except for the, the New Testament. And so that's, that's what I call this um, in, 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 in the title page, the quest for the historical Isa. Fantastic. Where is historical Isa? Yeah. Now people are looking for historical Mohammed, but I'm looking for historical Isa. Fantastic. Well, that's a, a nice follow-up to the earlier stuff that we've done about Mohammed. So why don't you go ahead and uh, share your presentation? Oh. It's over to you. So, so why did I choose? Why did I choose this topic? To be truthful, the topic chose me. I came across a number of very strange claims in the Quran, which suggested that Isa, the Islamic version of Jesus, received a book from Allah. Whereas we know, those of us who have studied the New Testament know that, the, that Jesus did not write anything, except there's one recording of him one passage where he's, he's said to have written in the dust. He did not write a book. He did not leave a book. But the Quran, on the other hand, states very definitely that Allah gave Isa a book. He gave to him the book, Sirah 1930. We gave to him the Injil, the Gospel, Sirah 5727. He will teach him the scripture and the Injil. 
So we see several places where uh, the Quran is very definite that Isa had a book and, it, and that it suggests he passed it on to his disciples. And, and then it, it's later referred to as the Injil in the Quran. The, the, um, the Quran mentions the Injil as a book rather than as a message. So where is this original book of Isa that was delivered to Isa? Where will we find it? Now I want to I want to um, mention just in passing that I believe Injil refers to the entire New Testament, and for in many ancient authors when they refer to the um, gospel, they are referring to the New Testament. They, they will sometimes call it um, the gospel the, and, the, and the apostles, um, rather than call it the New Testament. The New Testament is a late term that came about hundreds of years after it was written. So eventually they refer to the two parts of, the, of our uh, Bible as the Old Testament and New Testament. Previously, it was called in several different ways, the law or the Torah, the wisdom, which refers to the kithuvim um, or the writings such as Proverbs, Psalms, and other parts like this, of which, which are like poetry or wisdom. And then there's the prophecies or the prophets. So um, we're looking for this Islamic Isa, now, this is what Mohammedans think of as Isa. This man here on the right is Isa, and he looks, he looks distinctly Asiatic if you look at him closely, yeah. and, and so, which is consistent with a northern Iraq um, origin of Islam. And that's, that's, what we are, that's what we are starting to think, that Islam actually came out of Iraq or or northern Persia, northern um, somewhere in the, in the Caspian Sea region, or Babylon, but where you would find people who looked like this, looked like these characters here. Now the man on the left riding a camel is Mohammed, and we can see that Mohammed is higher and more important than Isa. And that's that's the, that's what Mohammedans think of Isa. Um, he's he's a lesser uh, of, of lesser importance than Mohammed. He's a lesser prophet. The 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 guy called Iyas Ibn Kapisa. His name means Elijah. And here we have a picture of Elijah on There's the right Elijah. meeting Mohammed. Because so that's quite interesting. He's just he's watching them from heaven apparently. Yeah. yeah. So we'll he we'll head for the next. Uh, slide. Now, this is the official portrait of Jesus, which every Roman Byzantine Christian would be familiar with. This is the official portrait. This is actually the portrait from Hagia Sophia Cathedral. So this, this official portrait was copied throughout the Roman Empire, and it would have been in churches all over the empire, including in Iraq, in Syria, in Arabia, and in Egypt. This same portrait was copied. And what do we see? What do we see? In it, the Quran says, Jesus is a prophet who is renowned, renowned. And in Arabic, that, oops, I have to go back. The word is Wajahan, and it means he has a famous face. Well, what is more famous than this face here? Yeah. And I think, I think whoever wrote the Quran saw this portrait. I believe, I believe that most Arabs, if they'd ever walked into a Byzantine church, they would have seen this portrait. Edessa con contains the image of Jesus. It was a very famous image for centuries, supposedly... Uh, given by Jesus to the king of Edessa back 2,000 years ago. And so this would fit also with this, considering the importance of Edessa to, this, to the story of how Islam began. 
So let's look at closely at this portrait. And what do we see in this portrait? We see a number of very important clues. First of all, the, there's the cross, which is extremely important. He's, Jesus is depicted as the savior of the world. That's the, that's the most important thing that you see here. And, and up at the top, you see his name, uh, it abbreviated in, in a short hand. And, and so this is like his first name on the left and his last name on, this, on, on the right. That's what the, that's what the author of the Quran thinks. It's, it's two names. It's, it's like uh, John Smith or Julius Caesar. Um, it, it, it's his first name and they doesn't realize this is a title. And here's, and here's the next most important thing we see, this hand giving a blessing to the Roman emperor and the blessing to the Roman empire, which rules in the name of Christ. Uh, the, the, the last thing that we see is Isa, or Jesus here, has a book, doesn't he? He's holding a book. Yeah. What, this is, is this the book that was given to Isa? Is this where this idea comes from? Well, for every Christian who sees this, they think, well, that just simply says that Jesus is the word, the logos, the, the eternal word of God, uh, the message of God from all, all, all uh, eternity. But for the uninformed who saw this picture, and surely all Arabs, if it must have gone into a church at some time, they would have seen this book and they would have thought, oh, there's the book of Isa. But that's not what it is. So Injil, as, I'm, um, as I um, intimated earlier on, is the name of the New Testament. It comes from Koine Greek. It's not a Syriac word, but it, but it is it, it's Syriac for Ewan Galeon, which is just a, tra a, a complete transliteration of the um, of the Koine Greek word Ewan Galeon, the same word. In Ethiopic, it's Ewan Gal. So this word Injil is an Ajami word, and that means it's a, a foreign or Persian word, and it's certainly it's certainly from Syriac, in my view. Uh, Injil, um, Injil comes from Ewan Galeon, Juan Galeon. It's sort of a contraction of the word, is it? It's a contraction of it. Yeah. And um, many people, many people in Europe, um, a number of nations that I'm aware of, use the word the Gospels. They just referred to the entire New Testament as the Gospels. Um, as late as 1903, the Macedonian uh, revolutionaries swore their oath on the Gospels, and it was actually the, the New Testament of um, Neofit Rilski, which was published around 1850. They, they swore their oath on the Gospels, but they were referring to the entire uh, New Testament. So I've, I've quoted here the authority for this uh, New Testament scholar B.B. B. Warfield. He states that this was the earliest name for the entire New Testament collection. Now, many Muslims want to, to wiggle out of this, but I don't think you really can. This is the authority that I've quoted here, and I'll, I'll let your readers read that at their leisure. Um, so we can move along. As we know, the, the, the New Testament was written by nine different authors, but the Quran's author believes the entire Injil was given in a form of spirit dictation to Isa, as in the same manner that the Quran was given through spirit dictation to yeah. Muhammad. Now, I'll I'll mention spirit dictation later on because it's very important. So we'll go to the next one. So what do we do? There, we're, we're looking for a book of Isa, and then we start reading, and we find out all the contradictions 
between the Quran and the New Testament. So we're saying the Quran says 21 times that it confirms the Bible. But when we start reading the, the, the dis discrepancies between them, we find that it does not. So where, where is this document that it's supposed to confirm? And I would say, let's just, let's just say for a minute that the book of Visa is actually the kerygma. The kerygma is the earliest set of Christian teachings that were preached from the day of Pentecost by the apostles. So let's suppose this, this oral tradition is the book of Visa. Well, let's compare that. Let's just go through the list and see what happens. The, we, because we can't have a phantom book given to Isa because <laughs> it isn't. Now, as, as Sheikh Yasser Qadi uh, said famously in the month of June uh, 2020, he said, the narrative about the Quran has holes in it. Well, this is a big, this is a big hole. There's just to just to interrupt there for a moment, yes. so our audience gets this. This is a major claim that the Quran is making, and it's a high stakes claim because if there is no such book of Isa, indeed, then it it proves that the Quran is false and it's, it's making it's a false. It's a claim. fabrication. It's yeah. a fabrication, and um, I would say, I would use the term rather than fabrication. I prefer the word mythology. Yeah. It's a mythical, mythological claim. Yeah. And, and so let's go to the next slide. Um, the Bible um, is endorsed in several places by the Quran. And so much so that the author of the Quran says, let the people of the Injil of the New Testament judge by what God has revealed in it. Now, Angel, in this passage, Surah 547, is clearly a text, because Allah revealed something in it. Yeah. Um, the Angel is referred to in the Quran 12 times. Is this a different Angel than the one that Muhammad had in his hands in, in, in 630? Um, to escape the, this problem, a lot of Muslims will say that hikmah is the oral wisdom. Hikmah is, is the cognate of the uh, Hebrew word chokmah, uh, which also means sophia in Greek and sapientia in Latin. Now, hikmah is also the name of a book in the um, Apocrypha the intertestamental writings, which, which some churches have in their, in their Bible. So there's a book of wisdom in, um, in, um, in the Apocrypha. But I think this refers to the, the when we see hikmah in the Quran, I believe it, that it refers to the kathuvim, the writings, the sacred writings, of wis the wise writings and the Psalms together. Um, so note, there is no evidence that oral, the oral wisdom of Islamic Isa was ever written down. So just to be clear for our audience, they're confusing the, the writings in the Old Testament with, with this Injil. Yes, as, whenever... As, a, as, yes, as an excuse for it. That's because hikmah often occurs in a list. They, they, they list the divisions of the, of the Bible. They'll say that the Torah... Um, the Zabur, which is the Psalms in Arabic, the Hikmah, and the Injil, and these will all be listed. And then um, you wonder what are what are all these words meaning? What, to what books are are they referring? And so the the author of the Quran has this idea that that various um, Various prophets had these different books, and they were all sort of. Um, uh, he has to mention them separately. When you say they mentioned them, who do you mean? Do you mean the the Quran writers, or do you mean the, the writer of the Quran, the okay. author of the Quran, is yeah. makes 
whenever he refers to parts of the Bible, he he puts a list of the different divisions of the Bible. Yeah. And sometimes he just says in jail. So he's very inconsistent. Sometimes he'll list them, and other times he just says the Torah and the in jail. Yeah. And so, uh, so in my view, he's just simply. Um, inconsistent in the way he refers to the scriptures. Now, I want to say one more thing before I go on about the word kitab, which means scripture, but it's a very interesting word. It's also a cognate of kathuvim in Hebrew. And um, kitab has three meanings. You can give it three meanings. It can mean kitab, meaning to write something or letter. Could be just a writing of any part or a scripture. It can be scripture just means writing. Um, it can mean a book. Al-Kitab is the book or is the scripture. Or Al-Kitab can also be what do we call what do we call our old and new testament combined? We call it the Bible. And that's a Greek word that means the book or the books. Yeah. You see? And so it, it, uh, the word al-kitab in, in the Arabic Quran, it, it can refer to a number of things. It's, it's um, pretty it's ambiguous. Not, it's ambiguous, exactly. Yeah. So we're going to, I'm going to just humor the author of the Quran for a minute, and I'm going to say, all right, you, you tell us that there's a, a book of Isa. Well, I'll assume that it's a kerygma. Now let's have a look at it. Let's see if we can find the original teachings, uh, the oral teachings of Isa in the kerygma. So what is the kerygma? Now, a lot of, um, a lot of people, even, even um, well-informed Christians, don't, don't know this word very well. Um, the kerygma means a proclamation given by a kerux. A kerux is a herald, just like some villages, I don't know, in, and I don't know if you have this in Ireland, but in England, there are some villages that have a town crier yeah. uh, who dresses up in a fancy 17th century garb and rings, and, um, rings, the, bell. rings the bell yeah. and then <laughs> shouts, hear ye, hear ye. Yeah. And <laughs> so... Um, this is, a, this is what a kerux is, and the kerygma is the essential teachings that were delivered by the apostles upon the, the day of Pentecost and thereafter until the New Testament was written down in its, in its current form. Yeah. And, and New Testament scholars now say this took place at around seven, 70 AD or before 70 AD, because there's no reference to the destruction of the temple in the New Testament. And that means it was written before. Now, the kerygma are those 11 oral apostolic, uh, apostolic tr traditions and teachings about Jesus and about Christianity that were delivered by the primitive church. And they're found mostly in the book of Acts. And they they were taught continuously until the New Testament was written. So here's the list down here. I won't read them all right now, but we'll go through them one at a time. So I'm I'm going to assume that the kerygma is the book given to Isa, and we'll see where that leads us. If, can I can I suggest that you do read it if, because it'd be good to kind of have an idea before we go into it. Just an overview Very would well. be really would be really good. Number one, Jesus is Messiah in fulfillment of Old Testament prof promises and prophecies. Cool. Two, yeah. Jesus was proclaimed as Messiah and the Son of God by his miraculous birth. Three, he was proclaimed as Messiah and Son of God at his baptism. Four, the good news of the kingdom of God was preached by Jesus in his ministry in Galilee. Five, performance of miracles by Jesus to, to authenticate his, um, his 
claims. I did say, or his claim, yeah. His claims. Six, the crucifixion as blood atonement. Seven, Jesus was raised for the dead to demonstrate he was the Lord. And when, we, when I write L-O-R-D in caps, it means it, it's a replacement of the Old Testament word Jehovah. So he was raised to the dead to declare that he was uh, God incarnate in flesh. This word would sometimes be depicted as Yahweh, but Jehovah is actually more accurate, I believe. Is that right? Well, I, uh, Jehovah is a combination. It's sort of a, a portmanteau way of, of um, politely referring to, to the tetragrammaton. Yeah. Um, they put the, the vowels of Adonai into the um, YHWH, uh, and uh, they've come up with the portmanteau word of uh, Jehovah. So it's not, it's not the, but that's the way the new, the, um, the writers of the, um, the translators of the uh, King James uh, Bible um, uh, wrote it. Okay. Because they were, that's exactly what you see when you read it in Hebrew. Yeah. You'll read um, the Tetragrammaton will have the uh, vowels of Adonai in it. So, um, so just reading it a as it is. Okay. Um, and transliterating it into English. So it's, I, I use that word because uh, Jews often object to us uh, you, uh, speaking the name of the, uh, the ineffable name of uh, the eternal deity. So uh, they don't, they, they prefer that we not use that word. So just, yeah. it's sort of a matter of, that's something I do in deference yeah. to this issue. Okay. So number eight, the ascension of Jesus as the Lord of heaven. And this is a very important one. The, give, the nine, the giving of the Holy Spirit to the church. Ten, the future return of Jesus to judge and restore. And eleven, a very, very important one, the great commission for the church to teach and baptize all the world. Now, baptism is extremely important because it's part of the charisma. This is apostolic teaching and uh, we'll, we'll go into how Islam completely ignores baptism. And yeah. I think I can prove that. Um, they, they, they wish that the baptism would go away because it interferes with a lot of things. So we'll yeah. go on. Now, in 1906, a very important, and some people would say seminal book came out, written by Albert Schweitzer, the famous doctor, who was also a theologian. And, it, and he called it the quest for the historical Jesus. Well, my quest at the top of the page here is the quest for the historical Isa. I'm taking, I'm, I'm doing for the Quran what Albert Schweitzer did to the New Testament. Interesting. He's, it, yeah. I'm, I'm saying to Muslims, isn't it time that you did the same thing? Now, where, is, where is the historicity of the Quran? What, what, what historicity can you find that shows the Quran is based on anything that's real? Um, that, that, what scientific methods are you using to find the historic Isa. Now, now, 40 years after um, Albert Schweitzer, there was a man in Germany called Rudolf Bultmann who applied existentialism to the New Testament. Uh, he was, it was a, very, a very intelligent uh, theologian, very influential, and he and a number of his um, colleagues um, in Germany. Uh, he was from the University of Barburg. And he came up, um, he, he started lecturing and, and, and writing papers. And eventually this book was published in 1953, The Kerygma and Myth. And his, his, his goal was to, as he say, strip away elements of a mythical world picture and apply 
scientific standards to the study of the New Testament and the kerygma. And he focused on the kerygma um, as, as the um, as the start of his study of the New Testament. So essentially he was, his aim was to get rid of the ahistorical elements and get to the historical elements. Precisely. And yeah. he's, he's also saying, what's the value of these myths? Do these myths have any value for us in a scientific era? Yeah. It would have been great so if, is, if I may... Yes. <laughs> It would would have been great to get uh, Carl Jung and him together in one room to to trash their ideas because I imagine a very interesting discussion. It would be a very interesting discussion indeed. Yeah. So, is it not time for the same scientific treatment for the Quran? So, as I I mentioned some of this before, the Quran claims twenty one times to confirm what came before and yet it doesn't. The Quran disparages about 90% of the Kerygma teachings, which are wow. essential Christianity. That means, essential means essential for salvation. If you do not believe these 11 Kerygma teachings, then you cannot enter the Christian church. You yeah. cannot become a member of it. You have to believe all 11 in order to to consider yourself a, a an orthodox uh, Catholic Christian. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you're a her, you're a heretical Christian. You're you you belong to some other sect. So the, essentially, to, to put it in Islamic terms, these are like 11 shahadas that you must believe in and and exactly. Assert. Yeah. Exactly. That's a very good comparison for a Mo for a Mohammedan. Um, you have to do eleven different shahadas. These are the eleven. These are eleven things that you must believe. The absolute minimum that you must believe to yeah. join the Christian Church. So these are not just trivial matters. These are very important. Now the Quran does not confirm them. This is what I discovered. Wow. The Quran contradicts them yeah it mischaracterizes them or it simply leaves them out or ignores them entirely but these are the cardinal essential teachings of christianity that we're talking about this is a very serious uh discrepancy yeah so um the quran will often treat these um these points differently they'll they'll say one thing in one passage and another in another it strikes me that the quran has been hypocritical in the sense it's saying one thing but doing something else in other words it's saying it confirms the well, bible the, and yes it's in exactly. practice it's not exactly the the author of the quran seems to have no um no concern and i want to use the word insouciance if you know that word, he just yeah. uh, a devil may care attitude concerning facts. It's, it's not concerned about uh, whether he said the same thing the previous time, or if he's going to say the same thing the next time. He just he, he just just says what he wants to say, or what his voices are telling him, what his spirit guide is telling him, and the spirit guide may change next time. Now, it's not to say that he was insincere, but the, the spirit guide, which was giving him these messages, uh, which he, he called an angel, um, it, the spirit could say different things at different times. Why not? Yeah. Um, and he doesn't care because he takes the word of the spirit guide. He doesn't, he's, if, if, if the author of the Quran is not literate, as we, as we often suspect, then he doesn't care about a written text. He doesn't understand what a written text is. He doesn't understand that it's a kind of a, it's carved in stone once it's written. Um, you can't unwrite something. You can burn the book, which is what Muslims often did in the early days, but you can't, you, the trouble is you, you often don't burn them all. So even if one book 
remains, one copy of the book remains, then you still have the ideas circulating. And you can't, and, and you can't get away with uh, being lo- free with, with facts. You have, to be, you have to be honest about this, that the, the facts are contradictory. So we go on. And um, oh, I just just before I go on, I want to I want to emphasize again that this shows that there are strata in the Quran. There are four four strata, I would say, of editing, and and the editor of the Quran has not been very careful. So, how does the Quran differ from the Kerygma? The Quran creates a different version of Isa, which I say is mythical. It's different from the New Testament Jesus. It's also different from the non-Christian contemporary historians who wrote about Jesus, such as Josephus, Tacitus, Mara Bar Serapion, Suetonius, the Talmud, and, and the Talmud was written in Babylonia, by the way, where um, where we believe Mohammed was located, and Pliny the Younger, a, a Roman, a uh, Latin. So really, the, so really, the authors of the Quran should have known better. If and, they had been reading, yeah, they would have known uh, that that their facts are at variance with these other writers. Yeah. I believe that the the author of the Quran was not all that literate, and I, I, and I think he was just quoting from them. He may have heard these um, these quotes orally, and he just committed them to memory. And then when he 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 brought them out, um, he hadn't remembered them perfectly, and it just and and the spirit told him, "Well, this is this is the actual fact. I'm going to correct those." earlier versions that you heard and i'm going to give you the correct version now yeah so um let's go straight into the 11 teachings oh there's one thing up more i want to say the quran all, uh, quotes from gnostic writings as well and it's different from those gnostic writings as well in the heretical writings of the gnostic um yeah. christians who were um who were let's call them poets. They were writing a poetical version of of Jesus, which was not based on um, history. It was based on um, a, a combination of different uh, Eastern religions, and and they sort of harmonized uh, the, those teachings into a into a poetic form. Many people like the Gnostic writings because they're so poetical, which they are.
So let's um, see the second slide. 